So this morning, I want to talk to you about justice. Justice has been a, a hot topic in 2020. We've talked uh, a lot about social justice, racial justice. Uh, so it, it's been a hot topic. And I want to talk to you about today because that's, uh, that's where one of our psalms is going to take us this coming week. It's Psalm 82. It's about justice. And before we can... Uh, can really talk about justice and, and kind of have some understanding there. We need to know what justice is. What is justice? If you had to d define justice, everybody knows what justice is, right? Well, what is it? Simply, it is to make things right. Would you agree with that? To make things right. So if justice is to make things right, then we need to know what is right and what is wrong. Now that sounds like a simple thing, right? Know what's right and what's wrong. Well, there are a lot of different opinions about what is right and what is wrong. Aren't we discovering that? And as our culture gets further and further away from our founding and from, from our Christian roots, our Judeo-Christian ethic, there's more confusion than ever about what's right and what is wrong. So we need to talk about that. So if, if we're going to make things right socially, we need to know what is right socially. Is it right for some people to be rich and some people to be poor? That, according to a lot of people, is the very definition of social injustice. Well, is it right for some people to be really good looking and others to look like me? I mean, you know, that is, that is appearance injustice. Is it right for some people to have incredible athletic ability and others to be klutzes? That's physical injustice, is it not? I mean, at the same measure, there's wide di disparity in, uh, in things. There's not equality. What, do, what, what about people? Uh, some people are really intelligent. They always make good grades in school, and others really struggle. That's intellectual injustice, is it not? I mean, it's not equality. How do we define what is justice and what is injustice? What is, what is right and what is wrong? You see, every inequality is not injustice, right? I mean, you think of the things I just talked about. Every inequality is not injustice. Some inequalities maybe are injustice. Let's take, for instance, the NBA. There are racial and income disparities in the NBA. The NBA has 74% black players, 23% white players, and whatever the, is left over in different, uh, different nationalities and ethnicities. The U.S. is 76% white, but the NBA is only 23% white. That's a, that by, by the definition of social justice, that's a disparity. That's an inequality. And black athletes in the NBA make on average over twice as much as the white athletes. In other careers, in other applications, we would say that's inequality, that that's injustice. Is that injustice? No, <laughs> because it's a merit-based system. Nobody looks at the NBA and says, well, that's injustice because, it's not, because the racial makeup does not match what's in the population, and people of, of different races don't make, on average, the same thing. It's, it's a merit-based system. So every inequality is not injustice. So we need to have a, a basis for discerning what is unjust and what is just, what is right, and what is wrong? We can't just decide based on a vote. Let's all vote. Is that unjust? Well, that's just an arbitrary thing. It depends on who's in the group that's voting, right? We need to have a, a, a basis for this that's, that's unchanging, a, a solid, uh, unchanging, reliable basis for making our judgments about that. Because justice is that important. It can't be arbitrary. If it's arbitrary, it's unjust, is it not? I mean, you wouldn't want to appear in a court of law and you don't know what's going to be right and wrong until after the verdict is rendered. I mean, nobody wants to live like that. So how do we create an equitable system of justice? 
A justice system is only as good, only as equitable as the worldview on which it is based. The worldview on which it is based. Now, as long as we're defining terms, let's define worldview. Worldview is the lens through which you interpret reality and what you interpret life and what's right and what's wrong. It's, it's, the, it's the framework that you look through as you look at life to discern whether something is right, whether something is real, whether something is wrong. It's how you view reality. And it's huge. Everybody has a worldview. You have a view through which you look at society, you look at things that happen, and you decide this is right and this is wrong. Everybody has a worldview. But we can actually choose a worldview. We can adopt a worldview based on reasoning and, and based on what we know to, what we think is right or wrong. We can decide, okay, I want to change, I want to adopt this worldview. So I want to just talk briefly about three worldviews before we dig into this idea of what is just and what is unjust. A biblical worldview. It's the first one. A biblical worldview in that God's righteousness and love form the basis for justice. In a biblical worldview, what's in the Bible, which is the revelation of God himself, his character, his ways, his interaction with humans... We can look and we can see what God discerns is right and wrong based on his character, his perfect character. People who hold a biblical worldview believe that God is perfect and that as they look at God and look at his, the way he's revealed in Scripture, that that defines what's right and what's wrong, a biblical worldview. An example of that on the world stage is the founding of the United States. And just a, here's a clause from the Declaration of Independence. And I want to show you how this undergirds, or how, how a worldview that's biblical undergirds this, these statements. Familiar words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That phraseology that is in our, our most essential founding document, the Declaration of Independence, which further undergirds the Constitution on which all of our legal system is based, is rooted in the Judeo-Christian ethic. It assumes a creator. It assumes a relationship with the creator. So, look at the phrases, all men are created. We all come from a creator as opposed to coming from undirected chance as opposed from coming from evolution out of nothing or out of the simplest uh, elements. We, we arise, according to biblical worldview, by design from a creator. We are created equal. That is, we have equal worth in God's eyes, even though we may have unequal abilities. Our abilities whether greater or, or less from person to person does not make one person worth more or worth less. Their intrinsic value derives from the fact that they were created in the image of God, not because they are talented and, and have something to contribute to society. It's based on our relationship with our Creator, endowed by the Creator. These rights, these unalienable rights come from the Creator. That is, basic human rights originate with God, not with government. Folks, that is huge. What that means is basic human rights have a founding that precedes all humans. That humans can't change what's basically right and what, what human rights are. We can't change that in the biblical worldview. God established that, and our founders tied into that. They said certain rights are unalienable. Unalienable means that they can't be changed. No person, no group of people can change what's right, and what your rights are and my rights are. The unalienable rights. Now, people, a lot of people talk about rights that are not unalienable rights. Some rights can be established by a group of people, by government or whatever, and declare, okay, these are rights. Those are not necessarily unalienable rights that you would look to the Bible and find a basis for that. So we're not going to try to parse those at this point, but just give you the idea that in order for rights to be unalienable, 
they can't be changed by humans. Does that make sense? If somebody can vote, if someone can declare that this is a right and this is not a right, then they're not unalienable. They can be changed. And even rights that you think are at the very core of what it means to be human can be changed if they're determined by a worldview that's not a biblical worldview, that's not rooted in a reality that precedes us and supersedes us like the Creator. There's a humanistic worldview. Science and reason form the basis of justice there. Humanism is the idea that, that basically man is the, is the end of all things and is the answer to all things. So that, that worldview derives its power and insight from science and from reason. Not a bad thing to derive insight from science and reason. A biblical worldview does that as well. It's just that in a humanistic worldview, there is no higher authority. What people think and what people reason from science and from their own intellect is the final order of things. It's the final right and wrong. Reason says it's not fair for some people to be rich and some uh, to be poor. Science says that some people are smarter and more capable than others. So those elites should be in charge of the distribution of goods and services for everyone else. So there are world systems, there are government systems that are built on this idea that not that rights are unalienable, but that rights are determined by people who are the smartest, who are the most capable in society. And then they will distribute things equitable, equitably. It's not rooted in a reality that precedes man and is higher than man. It's basically you're dependent upon a group of very self-proclaimed smart people. Maybe there's a, a diagnostic for that. But whether it is or not is something that a human is deciding or a group of people are deciding. So there's no such thing as unalienable rights in a humanistic justice system. That there's a totalitarian worldview, and that is the powerful create their own system of justice. Whoever's the strongest gets to decide what's right. It's right because I said it's right. <laughs> and most systems of government from the founding of the, from the, the beginning of time have been totalitarian, where there's an emperor, there's a dictator, who determines this is what's right and what's wrong because I said it. So they have the power and authority to enforce that. But it's arbitrary. Some of our systems of government today, communism, most socialism, is based on a humanistic worldview. Most systems of government in the Western world have eventually a basis in biblical worldview, but as we become more and more secular and we push God to the edges, we're becoming more and more humanistic in our country as well. So there are huge consequences for that, that that people don't think about as long as things are being made, decisions are being made that they like. But as soon as decision, as who's in power changes and the decisions begin ma being made a different way, you realize, okay, these rights were not unalienable. So in order to have a system of justice that's equitable, you need to make sure you have a worldview that is rooted in a reality, in a truth that's unchanging. In a biblical worldview, is that reality? Where God is the, is the, is the founder and final uh, creator and arbiter of justice. He creates justice and he arbitrates justice. So, now let's look at Psalm 82. It's a psalm about, um, about justice, and it affirms this idea that God is the chief justice that God is the, the creator of, of the legal systems that are just and right, and God has the right to say this is wrong and this is right. And, and, and cr this is injustice, and this is how you can, uh, through justice, reconcile that injustice. Verse 1, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So clearly, this is, a, this is assuming that God is the chief judge, that he is the, the in charge of judgment. Now, in order for us to understand this psalm, we need to understand who the little g gods are. And there you see that? God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. I thought there were no other gods. Okay, so the scripture says that. 
So this is not other divine beings that God is just superior to. What is this? In fact, the phrase appears again, or the, the word appears again in verse 7. The psalmist says, uh, I said, and he's, he's really quoting God, you are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, Jesus really helped us with this, okay? Jesus actually quoted that verse in John 10, 35, 34 and 35. So he gives us an interpretation of this to help us understand what the psalmist is talking about. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, quote, I said you are gods? Now, listen to how he defines who the gods are. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came... So who would that be? Who did the word of God come to? Well, it came to people. Exactly. It came to the prophets, and then they said, thus says the Lord. They wrote it down, or scribes wrote it down, and we we call it our Bible, (laughs) the Old Testament in particular. Uh, That's what he's referring to here. So it's people who have the, the power and authority to judge on a human level. But isn't that really all of us? You ever told somebody, don't judge me? Well, it wasn't necessarily someone who was in a court of law that was judging you. You probably didn't say that to the judge if you were in a court of law. Don't judge me. (laughs) You know, you were saying that to someone else. So in a sense, we all have an authority to judge people, not necessarily a a God-given authority. He's just saying that we need to, that some of the actions that we take are judgmental. And we can create injustice and we can, address injustice. So this psalm is really addressed to all of us. It applies to anyone who has the power to create or to rectify injustice. So with that understanding, let's dig in and and look a little deeper here. Verse 2, he says, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? There's another word that helps us, partiality. And by the way, selah, which comes at the end of verse 2, is a means to pause and think about this, reflect on this. How long Will you judge unjustly? How long will you create injustice, be a part of creating and perpetuating injustice? And he says, particularly here by showing partiality to the wicked. So God connects injustice with partiality. Partiality can happen in pretty much any environment, right? Partiality can happen at home. Maybe you felt like when you were growing up that your parents liked your brother or sister more than you. You always got in trouble and they didn't, right? Maybe you, you felt that. Like if you're in, the, you're in the other room and, and something's going on, there's a little tussle going on, a little argument going on, and guess whose name your mom calls out? Yours, right? It's like, mom, that's not fair. Why don't you ever call his name, right? Okay, so partiality can happen at home. Partiality can happen at work. It can happen in your neighborhood. It can happen in church. It can happen in a community. It can happen on a a statewide or national scale. Partiality, I mean, we've had a lot of partiality in our country that's not good, that's unjust. So that's that's a reality. Do you show partiality to people? Do you show partiality based on race? Do you show partiality based on what they could do for you? Like, do you show more partiality to people who have greater influence and power at work than people who are just like the little guys? Or do you treat everybody the same? It's easy, isn't it, to fall into the habit of showing partiality. And and every time we do that, we actually have the potential to create injustice. Verse 3, he says, Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Give justice. Maintain the right. So what he's saying here is that all of us who have the potential to create injustice or to alleviate injustice should champion justice for those in need. We should be champions of justice. We should be champion. And what is justice? It's making things right. We should be people... Who, who want to make things right. Make things right at home. Make things right with our friends. Make things right at work. Make things right in our country, in our church. We need to make things right in our school. So champion justice to those in need. 
Now, you can't champion every injustice, right? But there's some injustices, and let's talk about larger categories of injustice. There are a lot of injustices that probably stir your heart. So I would challenge you this morning, what injustice that's happening on a larger scale really stirs your heart? What, what really gets your blood boiling? What makes you passionate? What is it that really gets you ticked off about what's happening? Abortion, human trafficking, homelessness, hunger, poverty, racism, mental illness, physical disability, domestic abuse, addiction, reintegrating ex-prisoners, disabled veterans, and how they're treated. And we could go on and on. There are a lot of causes out there that, that are just, that, that people are trying to rectify these injustices. So I would encourage you, if, if, if there's a cause that really you're passionate about, research it. Get informed about it. And I would say also research local organizations who may advocate for reconciling, rectifying this injustice. We have a lot of great organizations here uh, in, in, in Tallahassee that are engaging every day in trying to bring justice to these areas of injustice. In our own church, Making Miracles Group Home, founded by Perry and Deborah Harris, is a great example of that. It's an organization that saw uh, Perry and Deborah, from their own personal experience, particularly Deborah, saw that there were lots of single moms living in poverty who were at risk for all kinds of horrible things happening to them. Domestic abuse, poverty. Um, they, were, uh, they had all the reason in the world to, to uh, have an abortion because they couldn't provide for the baby when they had it. So she got involved in rescuing these pregnant or uh, mothers of, of young children in, in her organization, making miracles group home, because she wanted these girls to experience the miracle of God working in their lives. And, and she has been a part of seeing God make miracles in rescuing these women. Some amazing, wonderful stories have come out of that. And by the way, they're trying to raise money for a new place. They, the, the place where they were conducting their ministry was a rental facility. It got a, had a problem with black mold, and the, uh, the landlord would not rectify it, so they had to move the, the ladies out. And they've been looking for a place to purchase, and they, they found a five-bedroom home. Um, and an office is on the same property, and uh, they're trying to buy this. They've had an investor that's, that's uh, fronting a, a large down payment and hopefully the loan, but they need people like us to contribute to that. And uh, we're a regular sponsor of Making Miracles Group Home personally because uh, I believe in this ministry. So what I'm saying is find a ministry like that that you can get involved with, a Women's Pregnancy Center, Teen Challenge that, that helps with, uh, with addiction, the Teen Challenge we have here is a, is a male program. We don't have one for, for, uh, for women yet. Uh, City Walk Urban Mission, Florida Baptist Children's Home, Good Samaritan Network, Lighthouse Children's Home. There are lots of great organizations here that do wonderful work trying to reconcile the injustices that maybe you're passionate about. So I would encourage you to get involved. Pray. Give. Serve. Vote. Vote your convictions locally. Vote your convictions on a statewide basis and nationally based on people who, uh, and, and parties that, that support what you believe in that needs to be reconciled. See, by the power of God working in you, you can change the world. Perry and Deborah Harris are, are changing the world for these women. I mean, it's a, it's a world-changing event for those women. Some of you are, are also involved in ministries. Disaster and emergency relief, that is uh, a, a number of you involved in that here. And that, that changes the world for some of these people who have who've been devastated by these storms or by local events. And you guys have been out there helping them. So that's reconciling what you see as an injustice. Number four, re uh, verse four, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Rescue, deliver, that is get, get involved with, with your hands, get involved hands on. And I, I would just say that just undergirds what we talk about here all the time, which is live sent. Live sent on mission from Jesus. To live sent with your neighbors in need. Galatians 5, 13 to 14, 
kind of enforces this. Paul says, through love serve one another. For the whole law, that is kind of the whole Bible, is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbors yourself. So loving neighbors is not this optional thing that, okay, love God and, uh, and go to church and uh, be nice at home and, you know, if you have time, love your neighbors. <laughs> it's not that. It's just part of who we are, what we're supposed to be and do. What does live sent mean? S-E-N-T, see people. Pay attention to the people around us. Engage people. Meet them, get to know them, uh, neighbor them, love them, serve them, find out what their needs are. And if you can, can meet the need, meet it. If you can help them find a resource to meet the need, do that. And, and the T is for talk to them about Jesus because it's all about the gospel. That's the most life-changing um, experience that anyone can have is to embrace the gospel through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the Good Samaritan did that. You know the story, Right? He finds this, this guy's been beat up by robbers and left to die on the side of the road. He saw him. He engaged him. He neighbored him. He did everything he could to help him uh, get back on his feet. Now, we don't know if he had a story about Jesus. He didn't know Jesus, but the point was he showed compassion to this guy. And what the Scripture says here in, in this psalm is that people who are experiencing injustice are living in darkness. It's a dark world. It's like this cloud is over you. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you were helpless and hopeless, but it seems like there's a dark cloud that's just following you around. Everything bad seems to happen to you. One thing right after another. Verse 5 says, They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. They feel like their world is falling apart. And then someone shows up to show Jesus to them, to help them with a meal, to help them with clothes, to help them put their house back together, to help them with an addiction, to rescue them from a domestic abuse situation, to help them understand that I need to keep this baby, and we'll be here to help you with, with financial support once you keep this baby. When someone shows up like you in that environment, it opens their eyes to reality that there's some hope out there. There's something beyond this, this horrible cloud, this, this world I'm living in where everything is falling apart. You see, confronting injustice helps people understand the gospel. It helps them see the gospel. Sometimes people are so wounded and so hurting and so distressed, they can't see the gospel. They can't see God because they're just they're hurting. <laughs> You know, their, their, their world is falling apart. And when, and when someone like you and I shows up and helps this one individual, you know, we can't help everybody. You can't adapt, uh, you know, embrace every cause. But you can embrace a cause, and you can help a person when God brings them into your life. And that's what this whole idea is about. That's what loving your neighbor is about. It's not loving the world. That's, like, impossible. But you can love Sue and Jim and John and Jane. I mean, you can love the individuals that God brings in your path. So the big idea here is that God will hold us accountable for how we confront injustice. He challenges us to confront injustice, to, you know, support justice and, and, and identify injustice and engage in, in bringing justice to places where people are experiencing injustice. So God's going to hold us accountable for how we confront it. Verses 6 through 8, he says, I said you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Remember, gods are people who have the power and responsibility to address injustice. We're people just like everybody else. We're no better than the person who's out there struggling just to survive. Just because my life or your life is going great doesn't exempt us from providing care for those people who are in desperate need. And Jesus basically told us in uh, Matthew 25 that God will judge all of us for how we treat the least of us. Say that with me. God will judge all of us for how we treat the least of us. He said this, telling this parable. He said, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, 
you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So what was the basis for that? What was the basis for saying, okay, you literally go to hell and the rest of you go to heaven? What was the basis for that? He said, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, and naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will answer saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. He's not saying that if you are very compassionate and you help a lot of people, you get to go to heaven. What he's saying is, if you really are a follower of Jesus, this is what we will live like. That's convicting to me. There have been many times when I didn't engage in helping people when I could have. I know that's probably true of virtually everyone here. So we can't rescue every person and adopt every cause. But we can be people who look for injustice, who look for people, who get to know them and do our best to help them with whatever they're struggling with. And in the process of that, use that as an opportunity to talk to them about the Jesus that's changed your life. Every year in these disaster relief efforts that the Florida Baptist Convention is involved with and our guys are involved with, every year people who have had their lives torn apart find Christ. In all of these ministries that I mentioned, every single one of them, every year, there are people who come to faith in Christ. Making Miracles, Women's Pregnancy Center, City Walk Urban Mission, Teen Challenge, all of those people, because they're helping people in their time of need who are living under a cloud of darkness and their world is falling apart. When somebody loves them, all of a sudden, okay, I, want, I trust you. I want to know what's different about you. Why did you do that? And it gives them an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. We can do that, guys. We can live sent. That's who I believe God wants Kennedy Roads to be going forward. Here's this church that they say they live sent. And our community begins to understand what it means to live sent. And I believe it'll be contagious. It'll be something that it's contagious for spreading the gospel. It'll be contagious for also bringing neighbors to do the same thing. To see people, engage people, neighbor people. And once they find Christ, talk to them about Jesus. We have the privilege to bring help and hope to hurting people and the gospel. Let's do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for challenging us. You challenged me this week. I realize that I can easily get all wrapped up in my world and what's going on with me and just blow right by people in need. So Lord, help me. Help me to have your eyes to see people in need. Help me to have your heart of compassion to stop what I'm doing and engage with what they need. And Lord, I pray for that for everybody who's here today, whether online or in person. I pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see the injustice around us. And I pray, Lord, we would not just tolerate the injustice, that we would discern from you which of these causes, which of these injustices we need to be personally involved with. Praying, giving, serving, however you lead us, Lord. I pray that you would give us your direction, your impulse, and, and your power to engage in justice and make a difference. Lord, we really do want to have a transformative influence on our world, the world around us, where we live, where we go to school, where we work, in our community, where we recreate. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be missionaries who live sent and bring justice to a world that desperately needs it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.